Okay, welcome back. Uh, again, this is Issues in Biotechnology, the way we work with life. And we're in the part of the course that deals with applications of biotechnology. And this part of the lecture series is on forensics. We have previously looked at the techniques involved with DNA-based forensics and some case studies which illustrate the utility of those techniques. In this part of the lecture, we want to examine the use of databases, particularly the national debate about DNA databases relating to public safety versus the right to privacy. I had mentioned in uh, the last part of the previous lecture that uh, Connecticut conducts a all felon database collecting DNA from convicted felons. Um, what are the civil rights issues that this brings up and what are the concerns? What is the debate versus public safety? If you have nothing to fear, uh, then what's the problem with having your DNA on a database versus the right to privacy? So uh, the issue of public safety versus individual rights is the foundation of the debate over national databasing. So we first want to look at what the role is of the forensic scientist, not only the one who is uh, collecting the forensic sample, but perhaps even the person conducting the analysis down to the detective who has to testify in court. Uh, what is, who is involved with the oversight of the forensic casework? Is this person working on behalf of the state or on behalf of the defense? And what is the balance between civil liberties and public safety that these issues bring up? So these two competing views, DNA solves crimes. Only criminals should fear DNA testing, would be one point of view. Privacy concerns, DNA is different. And there, there could be significant potential for abuse. What is the chance of fraud in order to convict somebody? Or misconduct? What about forensic bias? The forensic laboratory works for whom? an arm of the prosecution, independent scientific organizations, paid by whom, in whose best interest. Is the person conducting the cross-examination the enemy, or an independent, unbiased view of the process? Unbiased views can sometimes be difficult to achieve. So failures in forensics could result from lapses in judgment, misguided attitudes, personal ethics. There could be interpretational issues. What does a DNA match mean? We saw faint bands related to the Michael DeCorso case. What is linkage? Who determines that analysis? What's the possibility for human error? Analysts might lose sight of their proper role and succumb to emotional pressures of a case. When these issues are examined, however, it's generally not fraud. Generally speaking now, DNA evidence is considered to be quite strong and quite defensible. Why balancing can be difficult 
relates to the emotional impact of certain crimes. Certainly anybody involved with the investigation of a horrible crime would feel compelled emotionally Here's an example of a homicide by starvation. The victim was three years old, weighing only five kilograms at the time of death. You could see that the emotional impact of any investigator would compel that person to act accordingly against whoever they thought might have been involved. It brings up this issue again of the death penalty. Does someone deserve it? This is an age-old question for humans. For or against? Our country remains divided. For the death penalty, people might suggest that it offers deterrent. And there's arguments about that in the literature. Would that have seemed to have swayed the minds of the men involved in the Cheshire murders? Or if you've read Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, these people in their opportunistic fury seem undeterred by consequence. Some people cite the death penalty as being justice well served, a punishment meted out, a tooth for a tooth, an eye for an eye. Some people cite closure for the victims. Critics, people against the death penalty, would say that it's inhumane kill another person. Exoneration is also cited for people who've been wrongly accused and then exonerated based on DNA evidence which strongly indicates, proves, if you will, that they could not possibly have been involved. How many people have we put to death who did not do the crime? What about morality? Is it okay to take another person's life? And is it effective as a deterrent? Is it effective? Some people would argue, is it cost effective that to keep someone alive is expensive for the state? Okay, what about DNA debate? Should we expand the DNA database? Right now, Connecticut has an all felon database. Who should be included in a database? Certainly the technology has grown, not only to sample and test DNA, but also to store it in a database and to search it. So the issues under consideration include constitutionality of taking DNA samples from arrestees and suspects. Some states are considering an all-arrestee database, whether you're convicted or not. You get pulled over for a suspected crime, convicted or not, you're in a database. Suspects. Then what are the practical and financial considerations of expanding DNA databases? We can't now process the backlog of cases before our courts now. Not to mention that the United States is the most incarcerated country per capita in the world. What about the financial considerations of storing all of that data? 
You're talking terabytes of information. Well, these days, actually, that's not that difficult. In fact, you might be able to Google this kind of information. So financial considerations become less. But then what about privacy issues? What happens to a sample after profiling? What happens to a sample after a, a person's released? If you're in the military, your DNA is always on file. Should the public have access to that DNA? Actually, it could serve a useful purpose for disease diagnosis or for their other uh, scientific investigations. What about post-conviction DNA testing? Could felon samples be used to identify crime genes? Not likely, uh, unless we went back to the genomic sequences. Criminologists might be useful, might be interested in this type of information. Are there genes which predispose people to violent crimes? This is not that unlikely. Think of different behavioral disorders that are predisposed by genetics. Depression, schizophrenia, other serotonin, dopamine imbalance certainly have a biological base. Could it then be that psychopathic personalities have a genetic predisposition? This has been proposed by some. Could it be a defense? I couldn't help it. It was in my DNA. What about free will? Do we have free will? Or are you merely just a construct of your genetics? And then what about the possibility of discrimination by insurance companies or employers? Oh, you have uh, criminal-like genes. What about misidentification? Uh, there's a famous case that is often cited about this where uh, involved an arrest in the UK uh, where there were 660,000 samples in the data bank and there was a random match probability of 1 in 37 million but the wrong man was arrested data bank match probability of 1 in 56. What's the possibility of this? Well, these days, very low, actually. And I think uh, these days, given computational power that now exists, look at Facebook. Look at face recognition, let alone DNA recognition. Uh, so the possibility of misidentification is much lower than people would suspect these days. If even an issue, what samples are in that Connecticut CODIS database? Well, right now it's convic convicted offender samples and all felon convictions since March 1st, 04. And forensic unknowns. That'd be any DNA profile from an evidentiary sample that does not match the victim or an elimination known. Enter cold case scenarios like Rene Pellegrino that eventually come out to have useful information useful to solve that case. What are the qualifying offenses to get on a DNA felon database? Sex offenses, Offenses against children, murder, assault, and battery, robbery, kidnapping, burglary, juveniles, all felonies are uh, those that are included in most states. Having this database has aided investigations throughout the United States. Think about it. A person commits a crime in Connecticut, escapes to Florida. Later, DNA is found in Florida, which reconnects 
this web of database back to a crime or a connection in Connecticut. So investigations have been aided through the connection of felon databases throughout the United States. Why expand a DNA database? Simple, more hits. Someone breaks and enters in a home in Florida, leaves a spot of blood after cutting themselves on a broken window, connects them to a violent crime they committed in another state. Approximately half all violent criminals have nonviolent prior convictions. Before I got involved in this, I used to naively think as a plant molecular biologist that perhaps criminals was a career choice. You know, there are robbers, there are murderers, and so on. But I, uh, I don't think this is borne out really by what we see. And if only collected from violent offenders, the likelihood of a hit is reduced by about 85 percent. To exclude more people who could not be the source of a DNA uh, profile reduces the resolution. Why expand a DNA database? Protect public safety. Some people argue about the prevalence now of surveillance cameras. Your picture is taken over 600 times a day. Every time you walk into a supermarket, every time you visit an ATM, your local gym. When the perpetrators of 9-11 committed their crimes, we saw on television less than six hours afterwards that they had visited convenience stores in Portland, Maine. Do we object? If you go to London, you're on, TV, you're on, you're on camera. The effort here is to protect public safety. Why burglary convictions in a database for DNA? Well, there's a 67% recidivism rate amongst convicted sex offenders, and an average number of sexual assaults per offender is 8, and 13, 8 to 13. 52% of the offenders linked to sexual assaults and homicides by DNA databases uh, matched, had prior burglary convictions. So, in other words, a burglar might become a sex offender if the opportunity arose very quickly. A burglar could very quickly become a murderer, as we saw in the Cheshire home invasion. Collecting samples from offenders convicted of burglary could help ensure their DNA profiles are in the database before commission of their first violent act. I would also draw attention to the first statement I made about burglary convictions and recidivism rate amongst convicted sex offenders, that the average number of sexual assaults per offender is 8 to 13. That's usually before they're convicted of the first crime. One Virginia study found that 40% of men arrested for rape previously committed property crimes. A 1998 uh, British study found that more than 75% of UK rapists were first burglars. So what do these things, what do these people have in common? Opportunistic. In England, all felon collected databases get more than 700 hits per week. So increasing the DNA uh, database expands the number of hits. Approximately 85% of hits would have been missed if the database were limited to violent offenders only. 52% of Florida offenders linked to sexual assaults and homicides had prior burglary convictions. 
What are the future directions then for expanding the database? I think we could see mobile PCR labs, um, like we see here, plus the unit where DNA could be cl collected at the crime scene, limiting confusion in the chain of custody of physical evidence. An all SDE database, actually, uh, why not? An all population database, again, why not? Um, Perhaps that's arguable. I'll leave that debate for outside this class. But for this class, I would say that the data is manageable. Collection of DNA at birth as part of a birth certificate. You could argue, why not? Are we getting close to a science fiction Gattaca scenario? Perhaps. This would also include, then, a higher resolution for search as a family. It might not have been you, but it could have been your sibling. Will this affect racial profiling in a positive or a negative way? What about biogeographical ancestry? You're associated with a certain ethnic group, brings up fears of past histories in certain countries and geographies. I think we could see a greater use of non-human DNA and having expertise related to those analyses expanded. Rape. Rape in the United States. Sexual assault is not about lust and desire. It's a violent crime of power, control, and dominance. The United States has the world's highest rape rate of all countries that publish such data, 13 times higher than England and more than 20 times higher than Japan. An American woman is 10 times more likely to be raped than she is to die in a car crash. 61% of rape victims are females under the age of 18 years old. Every 45 seconds, someone in the United States is sexually assaulted. One out of every seven women currently in college has been raped. However, nine out of 10 women raped on campus never tell anyone about their rape. One in 10 men ra is raped in his lifetime. One in seven of those victims will have been assaulted before the age of 18. More than 61% of rapes are never reported to law enforcement. Approximately 28% of rape victims are raped by their husbands, 35% by an acquaintance, and 17% by a relative other than a spouse. 74% of sexual assaults are perpetrated by assailants well known to the victim. A female child victim is seven times more likely to be re-victimized as an adult. And nearly six out of 10 sexual assaults occur at a victim's home or the home of a friend, a relative, or a neighbor. One in 15 rape victims contract a sexually transmitted disease as a result of being raped. And contrary to common belief that violent crime rates are notably lower in rural areas, a recent analysis of location data 
collected from the 1999 National Women's Study found that 10% of women living in rural areas had experienced a completed rape as compared to 13% of women living in an urban or suburban community. And here are some references which relate to the data that I just described. The mean age of the first offense for a sexual offender is 18.8 years, with an estimated 8 to 13 rapes per offender. Detected to sexual assault, 2.8. More than one offense, 67%. And they're on the street. Care, custody, and control of convicted sex offenders is obviously an issue. Rape is wrong. Date rape. is wrong. No does not mean yes. No means no. Date rape is wrong. Rape is wrong. Take back the night. Advocate an all population DNA database. Rape is wrong. Take back the night. All right, let's look at some case studies. You see, an all-DNA database, an all-population DNA database, in the case of sexual assault, it's more than circumstantial evidence. So this case, I'll just go through a few of these and leave the rest up to your studies. So, a sexual assault by an unknown cab driver. DNA is extracted from an unsolved rape. The DNA database hit on an individual incarcerated for a similar crime. The individual dropped appeal of the first conviction, pled guilty to the rape. Additional time was attached to his current sentence and there was closure for the victim. It's an example of how the DNA database can be used. In this example, an 80-plus female victim was talked into allowing a suspect to gain entrance to her home. The victim was sexually assaulted and semen was recovered. DNA profile matched to a sex offender in the DNA database. The investigation led for a case with similar modus operandi where no semen uh, was recovered, but a cigarette butt uh, was recovered in a match. The case was adjudicated. In this case from 2007, a victim awoke to find an intruder in her bedroom at 5.30 a.m. and was told to cover her face with a pillow, never saw the rapist. The victim called police and reports that she had been sexually assaulted. A semen sample was recovered and a DNA database hit on a previous sex offender. DNA here is the only physical evidence placing the individual at the scene. In this case, a victim was sexually assaulted by a male motorist who stopped to aid her while she was changing a flat tire. DNA database hit identified the rapist. His history 
1991, three rapes within two days. Convicted and served only two and a half years before parole. 1995, 18 months of parole before arrest on sexual assault number four. 1997, three arrests for sexual assault five through seven. DNA database match number hit number eight. Investigation leads to two more. Now serving 25 years. I think this underscores the importance of a DNA database for sexual offense. And here are some other cases you can read about. Um, this leads me to this case. Um, actually, this one's close to home, no kidding, as in that I've lived in Stonington, Connecticut for about the past 20 years. Um, it's an interesting case where Leslie Buck was a middle school teacher at the Dean's Mill School in Stonington, Connecticut. And uh, she was kidnapped by her husband's associate, Kirby, in 2002. Uh, she was tased and hit on the head. She suffered a head injury. Uh, she was duct taped and put into her own car and drove away in the kidnapping. Um, she escaped when he got out to check a problem with the car. She apparently was able to fish her spare keys out of her purse, jump into the driver's side of the car, and leave him standing by the side of the road where he was arrested. She went to Lawrence and Memorial Hospital and was treated and released early that morning. Uh, that happened on a Thursday. She taught the next day. On Saturday afternoon, she was found dead at the bottom of her stairs in Mystic, Connecticut, where she'd lived with her husband. Lots of circumstantial evidence, DNA all over the place. What would you do to link a suspect to a crime? What would be the next step in this investigation? Kirby was in jail. When Stonington Police Detective Cody Floyd walked into the Mystic home on May 4th, 2002, he saw Leslie Buck's lifeless body at the bottom of the stairwell and said, it was clear that things just didn't look right. Now what? She's found dead at the bottom of the stairs. What happened? The medical examiner said, Leslie Buck's death scene seem altered before the 911 call. It was her husband, Charles Buck, who dialed 911. A Florida medical examiner who testified for the state at the murder trial of Charles Buck said the scene of Leslie Buck's death appeared to have been altered before Buck called 911, and that Mrs. Buck's injuries did not appear to have been inflicted by a fall down the staircase at the couple's mystic home. It could have been presumed, you see, that perhaps she was dizzy at the top of the stairs and fell down after a bonk on the head by Kirby two days earlier. Was she pushed? How would you know? Was she dizzy? Had she suffered some other ailment? Buck's reaction to his wife's death seemed fake, according to his best friend, who testified. So one of Charlie Buck's closest friends, Neil Baker, testified that he was shocked by Charlie's reaction to his wife's death. Neil Baker said he knew Buck for more than 40 years and loved him like a brother.
and testified that he and his wife visited Buck the day after Leslie Buck's death. Baker said that he hugged Buck, and Charlie Buck proceeded to whimper a bit. I was very surprised that the whimpering seemed to have been fake and there were no tears, Baker said. I was there with Charlie the night his father died. And believe me, there were a lot of tears. The state contended that Buck is guilty because he saw his wife last and found her dead. And because he lied about a certain relationship that he had with a bartender in town named Carol Perez. The evidence indicated that Mrs. Buck had suffered head trauma. There was no explanation for her death in the stairway where she was found. The two consulting medical examiners focused in on a neck injury that was not present when Buck left the house that afternoon. There were other circumstances surrounding this situation that buzzed around town during those days some of which came to light during the trial. Charles Buck was an electrician. He actually did work at my house. But he had quipped to another worker about a certain length of wire that was angular in shape that he carried an 18-inch piece of, and then if you whacked a person, you could do him in with it. It was remarked that there were certain marks on Mrs. Buck's head which corresponded to the angle of such a piece of wire. So what about Carol Perez? She was a bartender in town at a place called the Mystic Drawbridge, I believe, or the Drawbridge Inn. The circumstances of that relationship were investigated. Most of the people around Mystic and Stonington knew a lot about this anyway. Charles Buck had reportedly spent some $300,000 in a matter of months on Carol Perez. And uh, Charles Buck had consistently lied to police and told Perez herself to lie during recorded conversations about their relationship. When police asked him about the gifts he had given to Carol Perez, Buck's response was, I was just being a nice guy. That's all. Hmm. $300,000 worth a nice guy. He had denied having sexual intercourse with Perez, but admitted to touching her breasts. Hmm. If you had to vote right now, in this case, guilty or not guilty, based on the information that I've told you, which is available in the New London Day, what would you do? Guilty? Not guilty? Can't vote, not enough information. Well, I already told you what the law says in the United States. Acquittal ends the eight-year buck drama. Beyond a reasonable doubt. One of the most fascinating criminal cases in the Stonington mystic history ended in 2010 with the acquittal of Charles Buck and the murder of Leslie Buck. Although you can talk to anybody around Stonington and get their feelings on the matter, the law supports beyond a reasonable doubt. For or against.
Here we go round the prickly pear, the prickly pear, the prickly pear. Here we go round the prickly pear at five o'clock in the morning. Between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act, fall the shadow. For thine is the kingdom. Between the conception and the creation, between the emotion and the response, falls the shadow. Life is very long. Between the desire and the spasm, between the potency and the existence, between the essence and the descent, falls the shadow. For thine is the kingdom, for thine is Life is, for thine is the, this is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but a whimper. The death penalty for are against. You can discuss that. Thanks. <laughs>